Wait, wait, wait up. My name is Phyllis Webstad from the Strachum Chatham First Nation, located at Kenu Creek and Dog Creek in central British Columbia. I am a third generation residential school survivor. Over the past years, I've been working to raise awareness of the residential school system and its impact on Indigenous people. Only through education can we come to a mutual understanding of each other. After listening to the presentation of Justice Murray Sinclair during the Truth and Reconciliation hearings in May 2013, I came to the realization of the ongoing impacts of residential schools, both on myself and on Indigenous peoples. The following video is taken from that presentation, just as Murray Sinclair delivered at the Truth and Reconciliation hearings in May of 2013 in Williams Lake, BC. Justice Sinclair talks in a way that people can understand, and his presentation helped me personally to better understand my own journey. His presentation provides an outline of the impacts government policy has on Indigenous individuals and the Indigenous people in Canada. It also outlines the continuing repercussions from the residential school system, policies that are felt by individuals and general society today. Wrongs have been committed. They must be healed by both the survivors and the people of Canada. Only through education and the awareness it brings can we begin to repair the damage done. Only by taking the long view and teaching the children can we hope to overcome the bias that previous generations had developed and begin to undertake the healing process that as Canadians we all share. Please consider what Justice Murray Sinclair has to say on the impacts of the past and his thoughts for the future. Imagine, if you can, what it would be like if your children and your grandchildren were taken away from you today and placed in an institution and kept away from you for 10 months of the year, sometimes for the whole year, or sometimes you wouldn't see them for years, sometimes they never came back to you because they died in the schools. And sometimes if they didn't die in the school, when they were released, they never came home. And one of the reasons some of the children never went home was because the government wouldn't let them go home, saying that you as the parent or grandparent were an improper parent and you shouldn't be allowed to take care of them anymore. Or sometimes, those children were still so angry at their families for putting them in the schools in the first place that they didn't want to go back home. They didn't want to see their parents. They didn't want to go back to their communities. And so any opportunity that their families might have had to help them with their personal healing at that point in their teenage life was lost to those children to whom that happened or who felt that way. If you had spent all of your childhood years in your teenage years in an institution, nobody would ever be able to show you how to love. You wouldn't be able to watch your mother take care of babies. You wouldn't be able to learn what it meant to be a young woman because there was no one to tell you that. You wouldn't be able to learn what it was like to be a young man and the responsibilities of manhood, responsibilities of being a father, responsibilities of being an uncle, responsibilities of being a proper support to your parents or your grandparents because those schools didn't teach you that. What those schools taught you was that your language was bad, that your culture was bad, that your people were inferior, that you had no relevant or valid history, and that you should feel lucky that the churches were there, the schools were there, and that white people came to this country and saved you from a life of impoverished existence. And so those of you who are interested in the residential school story need to understand something that is very important, that it isn't just about residential schools. They took our children away from us and placed them in the schools so that they could indoctrinate them into a different way of thinking. They took the children away from their villages and placed them in institutions which were anything but a village. But then they proceeded to, to go out and try to destroy the villages. So they undermined our leadership. They took away the power of chiefs. They took away the power of women. They took away the power of our culture. They prohibited ceremonies. They prohibited 
gatherings. They prohibited all of the things that societies need to hold itself together. And as many survivors have observed, they took away our power. They took away our power to be who we were meant to be. So they took the children away from the villages and then they destroyed the villages so that when the children did go back to their communities, there was very little there that they could turn to to give them back what it was that they had lost in the schools. The stories of the survivors are still a story about discovery. They are still looking for why this happened and what happened to them. Many of them still struggling to find out. And their children, their grandchildren, still are looking for the answer to that question. Why are we the way we are? What happened to us? And the answers to those questions still remain elusive. But more and more we're discovering through the stories of survivors why things happened and what happened. And when we know what happened, then we can do something about it. Then we can look for those answers and find those answers in the right way. Reconciliation overall, from the Commission's perspective, means that we also have to convince Canadian society that this is their story as well. Because while the children in residential schools were being taught that they were heathens, that they were savages, that they were irrelevant, that their history didn't matter, that their languages were not worth keeping, and that they, in fact, were inferior people, those very same messages were being taught in the public schools of this country. And so, unconsciously, white people, European children, have been raised to believe in their own sense of superiority. And they're not even aware of it. They're not even aware of it. And how do I know that? Because I went to school with them. I went to school with them. And I can tell you that most of the people that I went to school with, though I am now a judge, and I've been a judge for 25 years, and I have uh, a prominent position within society, I accept that, most of them still think they're better than me because the schools taught them that they were. They would never trade positions with me because to them, living with this kind of skin, with that kind of background, coming from those kind of people, would just not be something that they could fathom. And so that kind of unconscious racism is something that the schools have ingrained into Canadian society that we have to begin to address. And so as a commission, we have said, we have to start addressing the way that we teach our children about Aboriginal people. We have to address the way that we teach our children about Canadian history so that they can grow up understanding that Things are not as rosy as some schools have been teaching. We have to teach them properly about the invalidity of the doctrine of discovery. The doctrine of discovery is a racist philosophy perpetrated upon us by religious societies and religious believers who taught that it was a useful way of ensuring that those inferior savage people in the third world would be able to be dominated easily. You can ignore them because they're not really human beings. Within the Catholic Church, there was a debate after 1492 about whether or not the Indians of North America were even human beings. And that debate was not resolved until the 1530s. And thank God it was resolved in favor of us they did finally rule that we were human beings, but of a lesser variety. And so that has come to dominate thinking for many, many generations, many hundreds of years. And you can't fault the people who are following those leaders that were telling them that. They were doing what the doctrine of the church, what the doctrine of the times, what the teachings of society told them to do, just as you do today. And that's why we say at the Commission that leadership is very important. Our national leaders at all political levels have to be speaking out on this in order to lead 
Canadian society in the proper way. And part of that leadership is to change the way we do things in our educational system. And that's going to lead, we think, to a new relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. So reconciliation is not going to come easily. It took us 150 years of these schools to create this damage. And you know, my grandfather was a carpenter, and he used to tell me, it's a lot easier to knock something down than it is to build it. And they spent 150 years knocking things down. So it may take us that long to build this back up again. But we have to build it up. Because as you heard here from other speakers, we're all here now. And nobody's going away. So we have to learn to get along. We have to learn how to get along. And we have to learn to get along respectfully. By understanding our shared past, we can build a better future for all residents of Canada. And only by understanding the effects of past policies can we begin to rectify the wrongs that occurred and develop stronger and more equitable relationships between Indigenous people and Canadian society. As Murray Sinclair said at the TRC hearings in 2013, we are all here now and no one is going away We've got to learn to get along, and we've got to learn to get along respectfully. Much work needs to be done to build trust and strong communities, and I thank you for your attention, commitment, and your support of the Orange Shirt Movement. Gukshjem, thank you.